you. Uh, so, so this is this slide's about Apache Cloud Stack's plugin model and how it balances a cathedral approach, very structured, with a bizarre approach where everyone can set up their stall. And it's rooted in a specific case study of adding Hyper-V support to Hyper-V, sorry, to CloudStack. Anyways, um, so I'll just start out with a little bit about myself. Show of hands, people who commute to work. Okay, I'm, I'm the only person who commutes. My com mode of transport is this bike in the background, nine and a half mile ride each way to work. It's a really good workout in the morning. Show of hands, people who work from home. How many, oh, it's, uh, well it depends because it's, it's uphill one way and it's downhill the other way. So <laughs> 29 minutes on the way back at about 30 miles an hour and then on the way there it's a bit harder. But there's a huge queue of people who commute and they're all stuck in a traffic jam and even though the hill really hurts going up, I will smile the whole way. I say, oh, I'm loving this, this is great. I feel like throwing up, don't let them know. So that's me. And then when I'm working from home, I like to have things to remind me things to motivate me. So you see in the background, there's my favorite cup. It's a nice picture of my wife there. And, uh, and the dog, of course, he's great fun to have around, a bit of company while you work from home. And it's all mashed into one place because I live in the UK. And the houses there are tiny and they were built a century ago. And so you've got to cram as much into as little space as possible. Okay, so this presentation, there's some things that you need to know, some background to understand what I'm saying. And that's rooted in the call for submissions. So if you were to look on the call for submissions website, it talked about the theme of the conference, which is open source community drives enterprise grade innovation. And I've emphasized enterprise grade because um, it's my position that for something to be truly enterprise grade, or what enterprise wants, rather, is long lived software. And there's two aspects to being long lived software. First, um, your software can adapt to changes, it's very malleable. And that's perfect for the open source community because our software is unencumbered by restrictive licenses. It's a transparent development process and you, know, you can get at the code very easily, that's great. Um, so it's like the bizarre model where anyone can set up their stall and start making innovations. But enterprise also want things that are gonna last um, for long periods of time, which means they want a certain amount of structure to the innovations that you make. Essentially, they want additions to the product to be decoupled from the underlying system. So that when that system evolves or changes, the, the innovations or adaptations continue to work. And so essentially, enterprise, they want a structured means to uh, extend or change a product. Uh, so they're not really looking for fork style and adaptations that are easily um, uh, become, uh, I guess, don't evolve with the underlying product, they're not good either. So the second point to make is that this track is about how Apache initiatives play a key role in, pay, in powering today's cloud. And I've emphasized today's cloud because it's my position that infrastructure as a service now, that's about embracing the heterogeneous data center. And what I mean is um, enterprise, they like these cloud-like characteristics of elasticity, pooled resources, metered services, but they want to be able to run an existing compute load. And that's a bit of a problem because if you think back to when we started doing infrastructure as a service, maybe five years ago, the papers talked about how you would get this five to seven times reduction in costs of networking, um, uh, power, administration, hardware. And that holy grail was achieved by using a commodity-driven cloud. And the problem there is that you have to rewrite the software to take into account a failure rate. So uh, you take a look at the archetypical cloud like AWS, and um, it's got a steady rate of VM failure based on when the underlying hardware gives way. Whereas the model that uh, the enterprise is looking for is uh, to, to have you, you know, more characteristics available to their VMs. So going back to the idea that enterprise, they want to run existing compute loads. Okay, well, so what does it take to run a virtual desktop? Well, you want to have a VM running in the cloud, that's great. Perfect for commodity-driven hardware. Not so good 
if you want the data to persist in that cloud. Then you not, need to start introducing specialized kinds of storage for the data disk, et cetera. So the plugin model uh, in CloudStack is meant to address these first two points, enterprise grade. Uh, so you've got these plugins that are decoupled from the underlying cloud stack, so they should last a long time. And then the plugin model as it stands really focuses on adding a diversity of hardware and resources and devices in your cloud. So the, the last point's also worth mentioning here. If you look at the call for submissions, they say, hey, come on now, demonstrate some real world experience of solving specific problems. So they don't want me to get up here and philosophize. They want it rooted in a, in a serious programming effort. And so what we've chosen to do is go for a plugin that introduces Hyper-V support to CloudStack. Now, that's well motivated because in, if you looked at CloudStack, one of the benefits was that it would simultaneously run a number of different hypervisor types, KVM, uh, Zen, um, VMware. And now that Hyper-V is a very serious contender for VMware, it's time to introduce it to CloudStack. And notice I've said uh, as a newcomer, I don't know if you guys can see that, but I've italicized it to emphasize the fact that, you know, I'm off on my own doing this. So I'm isolated geographically and by time zones from the broader, broader CloudStack team working at uh, Citrix. And so the experiences that I see are what a non-committer would see when they came to this project. So just, just keep those things in mind because it, it tells you where I'm coming from and what I'm trying to get at. Okay, so now I'm just going to make a series of points that cropped up when I started making the plugin to support Hyper-V. The first one is that they, the innovators, they really need the system to be disaggregated. So if you look at uh, CloudStack architecture diagrams, a bit like this, there's a lot going on. And the, impl the implication is that there's a lot of uh, knowledge and a lot of code to be understood before you can start making contributions to it. So you've got these boxes. When you look at the underlying code, there's a lot of interdependencies between them. And so if you were going to tackle the problem of adding a feature, not only would you have, uh, uh, you'd, you'd essentially have the problem that your changes would be difficult to isolate from the broader system. And that's an issue for testing, because it means you'd have to bring up an entire system in order to test your changes, which in itself is time consuming. But it's also, uh, it's also a difficulty because you have to wear a lot of different programmers' hats. So at the top level, you'd be more interested in understanding how RESTful APIs were implemented, all the way down to provisioning over in the corner where you're really interested in um, system programming. How do you control these hypervisors out in the cloud? So uh, in the words of Jimmy McMillan, learning CloudStack all at once is too damn hard. So what happened then is, you know, the CloudStack people, they realized this and they started disaggregating. That is, breaking the system up into discrete pieces. And they started with hardware. And so what they've done is they've separated the management of hardware in the data center from the implementation of the steps involved in an API call. So on the one hand, you have uh, hardware management, which is referred to as provisioning. And that converts a specific step in, uh, say, VM, deploy VM, or VM creation. It'll translate that specific step into something that's meaningful for the hypervisor you're targeting. On the other hand, we've got cloud orchestration. So cloud orchestration, that aggregates up all the steps in an API call. So take the example of deploying a virtual machine. You know, there's a bunch of pieces that have to, uh, there's a bunch of steps involved. And they're, they're listed in these boxes here. So the orchestration engine is going to be responsible for deploying a virtual machine. It'll go to the network manager, say, hey, is there a network available? Once there is, it goes to the template manager and says, hey, can you navigate this template down to a hypervisor? And so on, to the storage manager to build you a volume, to the VM manager to say, hey, attach the volume to something and uh, to a virtual machine and start it up. And that's orchestration, the sequence of steps. Then the other bit, that's uh, provisioning. So take the specific example of your virtual machine manager going off to a hypervisor and saying, hey, can you create me a VM? Well, it, it delegates that task over to the corresponding plugin. So if we're working, for instance, with Zen Server, it'll go to the Zen Server plugin and say, hey, can you make this machine here to the specs? So the, the issue there is that we've, we've started to separate these things out. And those plugins, what they're able to do is be loaded at runtime. So when the 
cloud stack management server starts up, takes a look at a list of uh, different adapter types and what classes implement them, and it'll load them. So, for example, you have a network guru for networking um, facilities. You'd have a, a hypervisor guru that's involved in supporting different hypervisor types. And then within the hypervisor guru, you'd have different implementations. I've listed here KVM, VMware, Zen Server, OVM. So the, the, the bottom line here is that within the set of available adapter types, you've got license to innovate. Step outside of that, and now you're not doing structured innovation. So what do these plugins look like? Well, they're, they're kind of a two-headed beast because they serve two masters. On the one hand, they want to play nicely with the CloudStack management server, and they want to be something that can be loaded into it and run by it. On the other hand, they want to be really suited to the devices you're going to control out in your data center. So it's got a, at the top here, we've got the server component. So that's going to be loaded into the CloudStack management server. It implies it's implemented in Java. It's going to implement adapter APIs. So if it does hypervisor management, there's a basket of APIs that it has to implement. If it does network management, there's another basket of APIs. Because it's in the management server, it's got access to the management service database. Um, so I put DAO, that stands for data access object, and it allows you to load in objects from the database, modify them, save them, or just create new ones. And that's the uh, management server world. The second part of the plugin is that it's got the server resource, and that's responsible for managing resources out in your data center, okay? So uh, the server resource, it's got a lot more flexibility to its implementation. So take the example of KVM. You control KVM using libvirt. You can't make remote invocations on libvirt. So we put an agent down on the KVM server, and it uh, talks back to CloudStack management server using a message bus, just JSON over TCP, and um, that works fine. But if you turn to a different kind of resource, like Zen server, well, you can make remote invocations. So in that case, we use a direct connect uh, server resource. And so it lives inside the management server and just calls out to the hypervisors that it's controlling. So that's, that's the theory behind plugins. And so now what we want to know is, OK, is it achievable? And when it is achieved, uh, what are the extra things that pop out that developers really need to understand to help them along the way to get involved? And I've just thrown up an example here of someone who's built a three-dimensional model of an Escher drawing. You're probably familiar with it. It shouldn't be able to work in the real world. But if you tweak things a bit, that works fine. So the, the first thing to mention is that Apache CloudStack, you, you guys probably already know this, that Apache projects have processes. I don't know if the process for CloudStack is the same as all the other ones. So I apologize if this duplicates information you already know. But follow the process so that you can get your code into the master branch. And that's really important because it's going to be a lot longer lived once it's in master. Because as the underlying system evolves, you're going to pick up the changes, right? It makes perfect sense. So you look back a few weeks, and we updated CloudStack so that it loaded classes and plugins using a slightly different mechanism. So we had a custom mechanism, and then we switched to the Spring framework. And the engineer responsible, he went and fixed all the existing plugins. But because mine wasn't in, in master, it broke, and I had this great learning exercise. And that's fine for me as a developer, but maybe not so good as, uh, for the enterprise. They want these things not to break over time. So they've got, uh, the, that's the URL for the process. And the point also is that there's not a one-stop shop GUI for picking up all of these tools that we're using to uh, make changes to CloudStack. So it's not like uh, Launchpad, for instance, where you've got a unified GUI. So it, this, um, this process also lists the tools you're going to use. So obviously, you're going to use the mailing list to try and get some sort of consensus and awareness about the change you want to make, the plugin. But when you go to publish it, that'll be on a wiki. You use Jira for a ticket for the feature so that you can track the progress and so others can see your progress. Uh, you're going to set up a development environment with reference to the wiki again. GitHub for source, review board for the changes. So this, is, this process is really handy for grouping up all the tools you're going to be hitting. Now, as a beginner, one thing really important to understand is that there are two wikis. 
and a third one that's deprecated. So we've got the incubator wiki, and that's, it's got a really clean, simple, easy to get involved look to it and feel, right? It, it's because it's been edited and it's consistent and coherent. And we've got a second one, which is the C wiki. And that's really for in-depth work. When you start grinding into the code, you'll see the detailed explanations. And for example, it's a Windows and a development environment. It, the C wiki explains how to get started. And down at the bottom, it's got a list of tips that specifically tell you the gotchas with master at that particular time. So the C wiki is very powerful, but it is crowdsourced, so it can be a bit confusing. And from time to time, it falls out of date. So when I first approached it back in November, I noticed that there were these details talking about Ant, and Ant wasn't in the build. So you just, you just raise your hand and say to the mailing list, hey, this doesn't sync. And somebody will rush along and say, oh, yeah, yeah, just forget that. I'll, I'll get to it, fix it for you. Just one caveat that we've got a pre-Apache wiki, cloudstack.org. and it says it's deprecated, but Google sometimes kicks that up in your search resorts, results. So when you do go to a page and it says deprecated, just go and see if there's something on the C wiki that helps you out. So that's the process. The second point to make is that simpler steps, they make it a lot easier to learn CloudStack. When you start writing plugins, the first issue is how do you work CloudStack? How do you make changes? How, how is it structured? And so you want to avoid taking on too much work at that stage. So take a look at phase two. That's my ideal. Look at this. We've got this WS management here, and I don't need a remote agent. I don't have to install this remote agent on the Hyper-V server. So what's happening is WS management, if you're not familiar with Windows, it's exposing the WMI system, and, and thus Hyper-V's uh, server 2012 control API over HTTP. So uh, WMI, it's the Windows management interface. It's a framework that Windows subsystems and services register with for control. They also share information through it. And the problem with doing remote invocations is that it's over DCOM. DCOM has a proprietary flavor. It's not well supported in Java. In contrast, uh, WS management, that's a bit more, it's a bit more, um, it's, it's got more of a flavors, flavor, uh, what am I trying to say here? It's got more of a standards uh, based approach. So the second, uh, issue with this design is that we want to start using these Hyper-V based system VMs. So if you're familiar with CloudStack, it's got these VMs that it puts out into the data center that it relies on for services. So it's got a secondary storage VM which manages uh, putting templates into archive, to, uh, manages archiving templates. And it also has a console VM, so you can pull up a console for VMs in the cloud. And it has a um, a virtual router, which gives you network services like NAT translation. And so we really want those to run natively on our Hyper-V server. And finally, we've got some changes here that we have to do to the core cloud stack because the orchestration engine, even though it doesn't have to know how to run Hyper-V, it has to be aware of Hyper-V image types and Hyper-V um, Hyper VMs. So that's great. That's phase two. That's the ideal. But it's a bit of a problem for us. The, the WS management calls, there's no really good examples online on how to do that. Uh, WS management isn't greatly supported in standard Java because these HTTP queries, they're just a little too low level for what it is that we want to do. There are some a libraries we can use, but they require a little bit of learning, and they've got some drawbacks to them. And the, the Hyper-V system VMs, I mean, those are also a bit problematic, unless you're really comfortable with rolling your own Linux. And is anybody here really just get out of bed in the morning and say, I'm going to go and rebuild a distro? You, you, all right, so OK. So it's not unheard of. But you've got to change over from the usual Debian that CloudStack uses to something that Hyper-V supports, like CentOS. And uh, when we started, you know, it wasn't really well supported um, creating new system VMs. So. We took a step back and said, hey, I tell you what, we'll introduce a phase one. We're going to get rid of WS management. We'll just have a local connected agent, and we'll use some examples of WMI and PowerShell calls, local calls from the web. We'll access it through the message bus. This is that uh, JSON serialized commands over a TCP connection. And we'll, we'll be cheeky. We're just going to use the existing Zen server system VMs by adding a Zen server cluster to the cloud. And it, using those 
little tricks, what we're able to do is avoid a lot of the uh, learning that would be non-cloud stack learning and maybe not terribly useful for a uh, beginner. So, um, geez, I can't emphasize this enough. You know, try to reuse and repurpose before rewriting. So y if you look around in CloudStack, there's huge amounts of stuff that's already done for you. And you take a look. This is the stack that makes up the remote agent from the previous slide, the phase one remote agent. All this green stuff. I don't know if it's showing up green for you, but it's green as in it's done. Just, you know, you can slap it together and configure it, and you're sorted. And this blue stuff, that's just repurposed. So we've taken existing code and reworked it. OK, all right, you're looking like you're glazing over. So what here, what's, here's what happens. The, the, the OS, that's a given. In our case, it's going to be Windows. Um, the agent shell, that guy is responsible for platform uh, operating system dependencies and loading and configuration. So it's written in Java. That takes care of our operating system dependencies. And it loads in a configuration that tells it what server resources to run. For every server resource, it builds an agent and pops in this, an instance of the server resource. So that agent, what it does, it goes and sets up your, your message bus. So as it spins up, it goes, it sets up a connection to the management server. And then it uh, does the handshaking, low-level handshaking to get the, the message bus going. So this is great. This is loads of stuff that I could have rewritten in C Sharp, but it, ah, it's already done for me. Forget it. Then w as we get up to the top of the stack, we start having to write some code. So the server resource, we borrowed the KVM version. Uh, and that was really brilliant because it allowed us to figure out what commands we we're supposed to implement. Because you get these messages that come into the agent, and they just call a single dispatch man in the, in the server resource. And that means you've got this, this, whatever, this if statement, the length of my arm. And uh, you know, it may say, look like it's bad design, but to me, that's perfect. Because it says, hey, you need a command to do this, one to do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then the final bit of the stack, well, we pulled some data, we pulled some examples of Hyper-V control from a, a driver we'd written for OpenStack. And that's written in Python. So you just spin up another process, and then you use standard in to pass instructions into it and standard out. And why is that possible? Because Python's JSON serialization is the same as ours. So the commands, we can serialize them. JSON out, Python deserializes them. There's a Python programmer in the corner, I'm sure of it. All right. So the point there is, as much as you can, try and reuse existing code. OK, so with that in mind, what is it that you're trying to implement? Well, the server resource commands are actually easier to log and replay than they are to figure out offline. And the reason is that yeah, I explained that this disaggregation was ongoing. We were sl was slowly uh, splitting apart CloudStack into you know, specific pieces. And that's not complete when it comes to server resources. So your server resources, they really should have some interface that says what commands they're going to implement. But if you look at the examples in the code, not all of the server resources tell you what commands they're going to implement. The list of commands isn't complete, because you need two more. You need to tell the CloudStack management server the status of the VMs and the status of the hosts before it'll do any sort of start-stop on that machine. And even if you did have that list perfect, you wouldn't know what the structure of the commands coming in are. There's just a lot of fields in them. So what you're best to do is to try and record an existing conversation between the GUI, uh, uh, well, not the GUI, the, the management server and one of its uh, agents. And so that's, that's what we did to, to get the ball really rolling, is we went into the log files and pulled out samples um, and then just put them into strings, did some JSON deserialization to reconstitute the object, and then just slammed it into our server resource. So it's a, it's a unit test, so it can launch the server resource directly without having to use the underlying agent, and so you're off to the races. And not only do you get your commands, but you get the sequence of commands, so you get the full orchestration engine uh, implementation for something like deploy virtual machine. So test-driven development, that's a really strong concept if you're doing plugins. Uh, another point to make, it, sometimes you have these big programming problems that you're going to have to tackle, and you're better just avoiding them. Because CloudStack is evolving. We've got all these participants. If you look on the mailing list or you ask the mailing list, chances are someone's going to solve wh what you're having difficulty with. 
So with Hyper-V, um, we have some problems that are solved by the ongoing storage disaggregation. We've got basically NFS-based secondary storage. It doesn't really play nicely with Hyper-V. And uh, secondary storage, that's where we put, that's the responsible for archiving the templates. And the primary storage, uh, that's the storage that the VMs actually run on, that Hyper-V would prefer that to be SMB. So we'd like to have some sort of SMB specific implementation of primary storage. And that kind of disaggregation would be a big programming task. So as Fade would have it, the, there was a team already working on that. So all we had to do is sidestep the issue, come up with an interim solution. So for primary storage, we said, okay, look, we're not gonna manage attaching the SMB. We'll just use local storage. And then for secondary storage, we said, okay, look, uh, Windows Server 2012, the full version, that guy can share the same folder using NFS and SMB, so we'll use that as an interim solution. Likewise, with the system VM creation, you know, we didn't have any CentOS examples of system VMs back in November, but now we do. And also the tool chain available for creating system VMs has come along a long ways. So, you know, sometimes you do well just ducking the problem until the last minute. All right, so one last point to make. Uh, you know, make sure you make advanced preparations for IP cl clearance. Did anybody take a look at the master branch and take a look to see whether this Hyper-V stuff was in it? No, good, because it's not, I left it too late to get my IP clearance sorted. And the uh, issue, the underlying issue is, if you're a project, uh, an Apache project, you really want to hold all the copyrights for all the source in your repo because it just makes good sense. You don't want any ambiguity that could lead to somebody to try and some law firm to take a swing at you, right? Why? Not so much the cost of the legal services, but the idea that some engineer is gonna have to sit down and write reports about legal issues, that's just a waste of time. And it also presents a cloud over the product that makes it difficult for people to get involved wholeheartedly. And the problem I ran into is I didn't quite understand at first how the Apache license works. Well, that gives you access to use the code, but it doesn't strip out the copyright holders continuing copyright over the software. And so, you know, you have a firm like Citrix, who I work for, and it's not their priority to make legal services available to their engineers. So when it comes to actually donating this source code to Apache CloudStack, it's a very lengthy process. And it's even worse if you consider that you know, lawyers are quite conservative, and they're very reluctant to give away pieces of the company without it being signed off at top levels. Yeah, exactly. So um, there's some links here that explain the licensing process, but the bottom line is that you really need to start integrating IP clearance into your development process at, your, at the outset. So understand very well what the provenance of your code is, and try and use the RAT tools, the uh, release au auditing tools. Those will go through and, and flag up any problems with the headers on your source code and make available to the mailing list details of any libraries that you rely on so they can um, throw up any red flags well in advance and you can code around them. Okay, so that's really it. These are some bonus tips that you can read at your leisure. They're basically some get out of jail free cards if you ever develop plugins. And this is a summary of the points that I've made during the presentation. So um, do you guys want me to read these out to you or do you want to ask some questions? Anybody? Well, okay, I'll, re I'll read them out to you and you can decide if you have any questions. And if you don't, that, that's, that suits me just fine too. Uh, so innovators, they need the system to be disaggregated. This is the idea that they need a, a place that they can focus in on when adding new features. Um, disaggregation with CloudStack, it's ongoing. It started with this separation of hardware management into orchestration engines, the steps, and provisioning the actual specific control of hardware in your data center. These plugins we're making, they've got two parts to them because they serve two masters. They've got a bit that works really well inside the management server, and they've got another bit that works really well, it's flexible for controlling machines out in the data center. When you do start doing plugin work, make sure that you follow the process for new features. It'll show you the ropes really quickly. And, uh, Make things simpler, simple steps make it easier to learn CloudStack. So once you get jump, when you jump into plugin uh, creation, focus on just learning CloudStack. So strip out the details from the ideal design that don't really help you get ahead in CloudStack itself. 
And when you do start writing that plugin, try to repurpose rather than rewrite. I know it's a big ask to learn, uh, you know, spend some time just learning about CloudStack, but there's huge benefits. I mean, you saw the pyramid, all the green bits and the blue bits. I, I didn't write anything from scratch. And um, finally, oh, well, that's not finally. Uh, server commands are easier to log and replay. So what I'm saying there is test-driven design, folks. It's your friend. And you know what? Don't even bother logging it yourself. Just go into the Hyper-V repository, take a look at what the commands are, and copy them into your own code, right? Uh, so keep an eye out for evolving solutions. And that's the idea that if you have a hard programming problem, you can just kick it down the road, and hopefully someone else will solve it. And finally, keep your eye out for IP clearance. It's, it's a kind of a pain in the butt, but it requires you need to think about it in advance. All right, so that's my take on plug-in development. I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you have any questions, that's fine. Uh, you can ask them now or afterwards. No questions. All right, I'm done. <laughs> Okay, well, um, so, so to repeat the question, did, did you spend your time learning how open source worked, or did you spend your time learning, learning how CloudStack worked? And could you talk a bit about that? Is that right? All right, so uh, the process, that's learning how OpenStack works. Sorry, that's learning how uh, Apache open source works. Um, making things simpler for learning CloudStack, that's a CloudStack step. So now we're 50-50. Uh, repurpose and rather than rewrite, that's a CloudStack issue. Uh, or is it? Let's say it was a CloudStack issue, so we'll go 30-70. Uh, Test-driven design, that is really, really is a cloud stack issue because it's hard to tell what those commands are going between a server resource and the actual management server. Um, cloud stack's evolving, may fix your, well, that's kind of, I'm ambivalent about that one as well. Uh, make advanced clearance preparations for IP clearance, that's definitely an open source issue. So of those, it's looking like it's 50-50. Yeah. Okay, so this this bit here, uh, to get all of this, you're talking four months. To get all of this, now we've added some extra bits, right? So um, let's, maybe, let's maybe just pull in WS management and keep everything else the same. You're talking, you know, depending on how close WS management is, uh, we're probably talking about a month or two. So now we've, we've dropped the time down to 50% less time and we're adding new features. So uh, it was, you, I guess you're talking about a 50% reduction in development effort once you understand CloudStack. Rough guesstimate. Man, I'm getting all the questions from the people I work with, and they're hard. What's that about? Oh, okay, so if you wanted to, you know what's really helpful is to actually say, hey, look, um, all right, so, so the point of this presentation was saying, hey, we're not going to do fork style adaptations. We're going to give you these plugin APIs, and within that box, within that framework, you're going to have a structured means to update CloudStack that isn't going to go out of date. So what I'm saying is, for those boxes, uh, how many were there? There's a, there's a few of them. But that's the adapters. For all those boxes, you really need to provide uh, a unit test. 
If you, give you, if you give people a series of unit tests, then they don't have to learn how to set up a cloud stack at first. They don't even have to learn how to set up their agent at first. All they have to do is get the source, fork the existing example with the unit tests, and then just start you know, hammering away, changing out each of the methods so that they focus on a different resource type. So that's, that's how you would really narrow down the effort, is just start removing the background noise and just going for test-driven development and providing people with the tests. Uh, so how do you handle versioning? Yeah, I don't fully understand that. I hard-coded the version into my... Oh, oh, okay. So does, how, how do you deal with the uh, evolutions with the API? It's not structured at the moment. It's more of the bizarre approach where you have to try integrating your code and seeing what falls over. Uh, but you can actually uh, have plugins out, developed outside of CloudStack. There's no problems with that. Um, at load time, um, CloudStack's got a file that says, hey, here are the different adapter types. Please load these classes. And they get registered as first class members within the system. So there's no distinction between your plugin and my plugin as far as CloudStack's concerned. You know, it might have different licensing terms. Or, um, and they also do different things. But you can definitely do third party plugins. And in fact, this Hyper-V now sits as a third party plugin in uh, repo and GitHub. GitHub. Um, any other questions? So Chiradeep, did you have a question? Yeah, so, so, um, so just to reiterate that, que to re-explain that question, um, if I'm targeting phase one and I've got this uh, TCP JSON very implementation agnostic message bus, then this connected agent that I have running on my machine, I mean, I could implement it in every anything. I could go for C Sharp, I could go for Python. So why didn't I do that? OK, so let's take a look at that reuse and repurpose rather than rewrite. I got the OS for free. Well, that's fine. I got the agent shell for free. Well, that's fine. There's not a lot of it in there. But I got this, this agent, and it did the handshaking for the message bus. And it set up the TCP connection. And it routed commands into a server resource. And it would start the server resource for me. And it had an existing service resource it was built for. And so you, you, know, you start moving up the stack, and you start realizing that if you start off uh, with existing materials, you, you're just going to get more traction on development. And then if you, you, know, you have specific characteristics you want to um, address and they require a different language, you're better off starting from a position of understanding CloudStack than you are sort of uh, being in the dark about a lot of pieces of CloudStack that you would have otherwise have learned. So I didn't use C Sharp because I wanted to simplify the problem. Is that you just scratching or are you asking? Oh, all right, no, that's fine. Um, OK, well, it looks like that's it. If anybody wants to get a hold of me afterwards, that's fine. And uh, thanks for listening to me go on. Cheers.